<laughs> All right. So today we're going to be going through Acts chapter 13, and I invite you to, to get your Bibles out. We started this tradition of bringing our Bibles to church, so I hope that there are a few here. I want to put Emily on the spot. It's one of my favorite hobbies at church, to put Emily on the spot. She showed her Bible to me and said, this is why I don't bring it in public often. Look at that thing. So different Bibles have all different, you know, personalities attached to them. It's fun to see. Uh, there's something about, at least with us older people, that we think that it's, it's good to have the, the Bible where you can hear the pages. Of course, the technological Bible is a great gift as well, but there's something special about being able to see the Word, I think, and holding the Bible for yourself, and so it's good to see that. All right, so today I'm going to begin a little bit different. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 13, so if you want to open up there, but we're not going to read the Bible right away. We're going to do a little bit review about something related to our church, and that is church vision. And so if you recently went through membership course, this is pretty fresh, but I hope for all members that we're aware of what our church vision is, what we believe that God has called us to so that we have a sense of where we're headed. And so the first question is, and you can just shout it out, what is the church vision? Excellent. Calling all to the feast. And then within this, there are three pillars. So don't look at this yet. <laughs> can pull it off for a second. Calling all to the feast, and we'll see that in a second, to check our work. But what are the three pillars? First pillar is... That's what I thought. We were going to know the name, but not necessarily the pillars. And I believe the pillars are also important for us to understand the vision itself. So the first pillar is something about God. It's a good start, right? <laughs> something about eating. You're like, God and eating. Good, feasting. So remember, it's calling all to the feast. And so the first one is feasting on God. We're eating God. We're a bunch of cannibals here. So what does that mean? It means that we are eating the word of God, that we're fellowshipping with God. It's the first commandment, right? The first commandment is supposed to fuel not just our church, but every church, that your intimacy with God should be the starting point with everything else, that the feast in which we're to have is the feast with the Lord around his presence, around his word. We're feasting on God together. Number two. Pastor Susie, you taught this, right? If she's watching. What was it, Jesse? A hint. All right. All right. So other, oh, I heard something. What? Feasting together. That's very close. It's inviting others to the feast. Okay. So the first one is me and God, right? Personal. And then the second one is it's also about others. That's what the Bible says, second commandment, where you want to bring other people into the feast as well. If it's only about that I can experience his goodness and intimacy in my life, but we don't care about the people around us, that's not Jesus' heart for us either. So inviting others to the feast. So let's say them again, the first two. I want to make sure we're learning the review. What's the first one? Feasting on God. Second one. And the third one? I feel like some will know this. What is it? Again, we're not looking at the... <laughs> preparing for the end times feast. All right, there, there you have it. So you can see officially on the board right now, feasting on God together, inviting others to the feast in preparation for the end times feast. And then the bottom says, giving ourselves to the great commandment and engaging in the great commission unto the great return. That's saying the same thing. Maybe I'll put it in the email this week to make sure that we, we remember this. And so this is the threefold nature of the church vision of calling all to the feast. Now, if God did indeed call us to these pillars, and again, you can weigh whether God called us to that or not, but certainly the first two, that's what Jesus says, the first and the second great commandment, and then also the idea that we talked about in the retreat of John the Baptist preparing the way for the return of the Lord. And I believe that we have great scriptural examples that God wants to prepare his people for his coming. And so these are, are definitely scriptural truths, but also what we believe that God has called us to individually as a church family to focus on in terms of messaging, in terms of vision, focus. And so it's good that we remember what those are. 
So if God indeed called us to these three pillars, then I believe it's fair to assume that it is God's will to move us in this direction, to prepare us to walk in the entirety of these callings. It would seem strange to just say, like, these are the vision, and then we don't actually move towards those. And I would imagine that you've seen us move towards some of these things. I mean, at the end of the day, K1, you know, this, this intimacy with Jesus, ministry, the, the idea that we seek first his kingdom above everything else is ultimately, I believe, a feasting on God ministry. And this has been going for like 12, 13 years. I don't know the exact amount of time, but consistently through good seasons, through bad seasons, this has been the never stop kind of ministry that we've had at this church. And whether you know it or not, I believe that this is the greatest gift that God has given us as a spiritual family to have a people, to have a place that has been pursuing intimacy with Jesus as the first in the kingdom. The second one, maybe we haven't heard so much about, the inviting others to the feast. But the third one, we've been talking a lot about that in our house churches, the idea of what is the end from the beginning? How does, right now we're going through Genesis, right? How does the Genesis chapter that we looked at connect to the end time storyline? In the retreat, we, you know, Pastor Susie went through passage after passage, preparing us, talking about this, bringing this to the forefront. But I believe number two today is what the Lord put on my heart to highlight something that maybe we've forgotten about. We don't remember what, what the name was, as we just saw, but also we haven't been pursuing that in an intentional way. And my point is not like, you guys are missing it, we're missing it because we're not pursuing it. I believe that the conversation that God wants me to stir this morning is remembering that it's in that list, that I believe it's in God's heart for us to consider. And number two is, how is we, as a people, can be in preparation for the time in which the Lord would bring this into more of a forefront in our church community. And pillar number two, in my understanding, is primarily related to missions. Not only missions, there's probably different ways and different understandings in which we can see this, the second commandment ministry, but inviting others to the feast, I think about going out going out to the highways and byways of using scriptural language and inviting people to the feast, inviting them into the relationship with Jesus Christ, bringing them into the reconciliation ministry with God, that this is missions at our church. And before Amy and I arrived here at this church in 2017, there was a lot of missions activity at New Philly. How many are like 10-year kind of New Philly people? More than 2017 before that. We've got a handful of you guys. And isn't it true that the missions activity here was pretty awesome? I thought I was going to get a yeah, all right. Because <laughs> I never got to experience that. I'm just literally going off the, the stories that I heard. There were, first of all, the media team was so good at making these, these, the experience look really awesome. But it wasn't just the media that I actually heard the stories, the people coming to faith and the joy of the team and going out and ministering to the Lord. They, they, there was such fruit that came. And then in 2018, you know, there was a lot of turmoil that happened within the church, and basically little by, or actually more, more or less all of a sudden, the missions activity was stopped. And there was even domestic ministry as well. There was something called a Mayus campus ministry, that in the college campuses here in Seoul, there was actually ministry to, to the youth. Was anyone like saved out of that or at least really involved in Emmaus ministry that's here? Were you saved or you were just involved in it? You were what? You were involved. But was it fruitful for you? Yeah. And so, again, that was something before Amy and I, my time, but I heard that there was a lot of fruit among the young people in the missions activity in this church. And again, this was effectively all stopped. Using scriptural language, I believe this was a well that was closed. What am I referring to? Those who have studied Genesis maybe, rem maybe would remember this. But Abraham had these wells that God gave him where you know, they were receiving water. And then during the time of the Philistines, these wells were closed. And then eventually Isaac reopened the wells of Abraham, his father. And I believe that spiritually that there was a season in which much of New Philly activities that God did birth and there was great fruit that these wells were closed. But that he spoke a while back, I believe, and said, I'm going to begin to open up these wells again in the spiritual community. It may not look the same, and I think we should be careful about assuming it will be exactly the same as it was before. 
But I want to say that there is a foundation here of missions activity that I believe that God has not forgotten about. And he's saying there's a reason that your pillar number two is focusing on inviting people in. That there's missions dream on God's heart for this spiritual community. And he's going to effectively reopen these wells that have been for a long time, looks like they were closed forever. But under a new generation, under the generation of Isaac, so to speak, that God would open up these wells again. And if this is the case, again, there was a t- there's a preparation that he expects out of a spiritual family to get ready. We don't just respond when it comes. I believe that he actually wants us to get ready for missions activity that the well will be opened again. And so, for this morning, we're going to look at Acts chapter 13, and hopefully, I gave you like seven minutes, so hopefully by now you found Acts chapter 13. And this is about the church of Antioch. The church of Antioch was a church that released incredible missionary activity. The first mission church, actually, in the Bible. There was evangelistic outreach. There was people getting saved. There was, you know, the Acts 2 moment of preaching where 3,000 get saved. But actually, the first like commissioning effort in the entire Bible for missions activity to come. And so if eventually we're going to be in a season of transition that God is going to release us into missions again, and I'm not saying this is like for next week we have an announcement. We're going to be going to this country. This is down the road. I don't know what God's timing is, but I do feel the urge to say that eventually we're going to go into missions activity again as a church community. And if that's true, I believe that Acts chapter 13 about the church of Antioch may give us some hints, some clues about how we as a people can be in a season of preparation in this first missions church. So I'll be reading from the ESV, just four verses this morning. Now there, we're in the church at Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menin, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While these ones, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So a little background again, I, I started the conversation a little bit in terms of the impact that this church had as a great mission-sending church and this moment of commissioning for the first time of formal mission-sending in church history. But what's happening in the book of Acts? Because we're just jumping into 13 and we haven't studied you know, Acts as, as a group before, so just a little bit of, of background before we get caught up here. So the book of Acts has also been called as Acts of the Apostles. Acts just meaning activities or what they were doing. Some people have also rightly called it Acts of the Holy Spirit because at the end of the day, if a church is just people doing activities, it's not a church. It has to be God-breathed, God-led. And so the works that the apostles did, the actions that the apostles did, the activities were ultimately Holy Spirit activities. So Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Holy Spirit. And what's the order that we see in the book of Acts? Well, it basically is the continuation of Jesus' ministry after his resurrection and then his ascension. And so Luke and Acts, I don't know if you know this, but Acts was actually written also by Luke. And so Luke and Acts were originally one book. And so it's basically Luke to just Acts, you just read it straight through. Jesus' life, Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus' resurrection, which is the beginning of Acts, and then continuing on with what happens to the church as Jesus is physically not with them, but his spirit continues in the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus, right before he ascends, he says what? He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so after Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see a continuation of the movement of the Holy Spirit in these exact places that Jesus said. 
So Acts chapter 5, for example, says, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. So this is Paul as the narrator basically putting this insert and saying, as exactly as Jesus said, it's in Jerusalem. Then moving on, it says, Acts chapter 8, the, the people were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So because of persecution, God actually forced the movement of, of the word of the Lord, of the gospel, to spread throughout Judea and Samaria. And so again, it's Paul, the narrator, saying, see, I said Jerusalem, now it's in Judea and Samaria. And at this point, we're fully ready for the gospel to be spread to the ends of the earth. If you remember in the story of Acts chapter 10, talking about Cornelius, the first Gentile, the first person of, of a foreign nation other than the Jewish people, who's basically the door is opened up fully for, for the gospel to be spread to all the nations, right? There was this man, the Ethiopian eunuch, who before also was led to the Lord, but in terms of like the fullness of the Gentiles, the, the first moment is Acts chapter 10 to this man named Cornelius. But there still wasn't the, the moment of the pushing towards all the nations yet until this moment at Acts chapter 13. And up to this point as well, it was all focused really on the church in Jerusalem, Right? There was some activity now in Judea and Samaria, but the church of Jerusalem was the center point church. At this point, the authority actually shifts from the church of Jerusalem, or the impact or the references, mostly from the church of Jerusalem to the church of Antioch. And so Antioch now becomes basically the center of Christianity, and it would be effectively for the next 400 years the most impactful, influential church until centuries later, this place called Constantinople, that's modern-day Istanbul in Turkey, uh, then comes on the scene if you're familiar with some church history. And so this is a moment of great transition. It's the moment that the gospel is now going to fulfill what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And it's also a moment when he chooses his vessel to release this great missionary activity in the church of Antioch. And we see in this passage this morning, the first verse talks about who is in this church. Who are the leaders in this greatest missionary thrust that has ever happened? Who are these leaders? Number one, we see Barnabas. This is Acts chapter 13, verse 1. There were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menin, and Saul. And so who are these five figures? Because I believe it can give us a grid of what a church, what a church leadership team can look like that's about to send out missionary activity. What can we learn from this short verse here? First of all, you got Barnabas. I'm assuming you guys have heard about this figure named Barnabas who appears throughout the book of Acts. He was known, that's actually not his real name. It was a nickname that was given to him. His real name was Joseph or Joseph, depending on translation. Barnabas means son of encouragement. Every church needs a son of encouragement. Someone who's like, I feel like Tom is somebody like that. Like after I finish preaching, I, I go up to Tom and he'll say like, oh, thank you so much for preaching that word. I see in a quiet way, he encourages a lot of people. I'm so grateful for churches that have encouragers in the church. We have Barnabas, who's a great encourager. We find out about him. He's a Levite and he actually sold a lot of property that he had and gave it to the, gave it to the church. He was an encourager and, an import, and actually the one who brought Paul, who brought Saul into this ministry here. You have Simeon. Simeon is called Niger. And actually what Niger means is, is black. He's a black guy. That's what that says. <laughs> kind of an unusual way to say it, but he, he was an African brother that came into this church. And some church tradition actually assumes that this was the same Simon of Cyrene. If you're familiar with that term, that was, if you're familiar with that name, he was the one to actually carry the cross of Jesus on Calvary. There was this man who was visiting on Passover, and he carried the cross of Jesus. We don't know for sure, but that's what church tradition tells us. Then there's another man named Lucius of Cyrene. So if this Simeon is Simon of Cyrene, Cyrene is northern Africa and what is called, what is Libya today, if this is the same Simon of Cyrene, then it's interesting that this other person, Lucius of Cyrene, is from the same place. 
They're basically two African brothers. Now, one was black and one was, I don't know why it does, he's not called the black guy. Maybe it's because there was already a black guy, who knows, but he's also from Africa. Maybe, maybe, he had, you know, maybe he was a lighter black, we don't know. But he's also part of this church. And so you got two African brothers that are in this church. You got this Jewish guy, Barnabas, who's this encourager. You have Menin, and it says, a very interesting thing about him, he's a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch. So when you read the Bible, you read a lot about Herod, and sometimes Herod will die, and then like a few chapters later, there's another Herod, and it's it, ever been confused by that point? Like, why, why do I keep hearing about Herod? Is he resurrected from the dead? What's, what's Herod's deal? So there were a lot of Herods, okay? So there's Herod the Great, for example, you know, when, when, you know the, in the birth of Jesus. This is Herod Antipas. This Herod was the one to put John the Baptist to death. He was, he was basically, you know, he took his brother's, uh, you know, wife to be his own, and John the Baptist says, this is sinful, and rebukes him, and he ends up being killed for that. So Herod Antipas is like an incredibly wicked dude, and this guy Menin grew up as a family friend of him. Can you imagine what a different direction these two family friends end up? One ends up killing John the Baptist, the one who calls the greatest man born to a woman, and the other one becomes an elder in this missions church. It goes to show you that how you start doesn't have to be how you end, right? <laughs> that there, some of us have some pretty messed up backgrounds. You know, even some people have ended up in prison and end up leading, you know, churches and we have one from Pusan. Our Pusan campus pastor was actually in prison for a couple of years and ends up, you know, most tender, amazing man of God. And so regardless of how you start, there's amazing hope here. This guy grew up as a childhood friend. The Greek actually leaves it kind of confusing, and it can even be someone who breastfed from the same mom. Okay, he, he could have been a foster brother. We don't know, like, how close they were. But that's like as close as it gets. But anyway, they were very close, this guy Menin and Herod. And, and also it means that Menin would have grown up with great privilege, great royalty. He was a rich guy. And he's part of this church. And then you have Saul, who also known as Paul, and you're familiar with Saul. And he, was, uh, he, he grew up in Tarsus in modern-day Turkey, was raised as a Jew, became a Jew ab above Jews, a great Pharisee, also was... was uh, was a Roman citizen, so the privilege that associated with that, he was familiar with Greek culture, and you're familiar with Saul. But just think about what a unique team we have here. We got a couple of Jews, Saul and Barnabas. We got a couple of Africans, and we got Herod's childhood friend that are all part of this leadership team. And so at the end of the day, it's godliness that defines a leadership team. It's not backgrounds. And God actually purposely will bring a very different group together to be able to, to be blessed by each other, to be able to sometimes be iron sharpening iron, by the way. But I believe also that as you're preparing as a team to be sent out in missions, it helps if you've already had some cross-cultural missionary experiences with your own team. You know, when, when Gina, Pastor Susie, and I are having lunch, like, we see things differently, we eat different foods, you know, we, 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 our worlds are just very different many times, our personality, our giftings, all those things, and sometimes that can be a place of potential disagreement, but it's also an amazing opportunity for missions activity to wrestle in the context of a group like that. And so I just wanted to mention that, the diversity of that initial sending team, of that leadership team, quite fascinating to see that, and I believe that was intentional of the Lord. Even as last week was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, his birthday on January 15th, I'm thinking ultimately the reconciliation of the gospel we see to happen in churches. What a unique, uh, racially diverse, ethnically diverse, economically diverse group that God brings together to accomplish his purposes. So those were who the leaders were in this church. Now, the question is, how is it launched, which is what I want to focus on this morning. And so my title for today is A Spirit-Led Call to Missions. Spirit-Led Call to Missions. Because it's not just gathering a diverse group together, but it's a diverse group together who are led by the Spirit of God. And I want us to see a map here before we jump in fully. 
And this is what I'm talking about, the missionary activity that would change Christianity forever. What happens in these four verses is actually what launches this. This is Paul's first missionary journey. Paul has three missionary journeys during his lifetime. Uh, some have said that there were, there were four, fourth being the time that he went to Rome uh, for imprisonment where he was later beheaded. But three is kind of the official number of the missionary activity. And again, it was the first time in which missions activity was mobilized in a formal way. Jesus did say to his disciples, you're going to go out to the ends of the earth. And there was, you know, great evangelistic effort that would happen kind of informally. But this is the first time that a missionary was sent out from the church and, and the fruit that came forth from it. Literally, all of us who have inherited the faith of Christ, in part, it's because of what happened here in this prayer meeting. And so this is actually the journey of that first missionary activity. The, the red is where they, where they went originally, and then the blue is just the return. And so they went from this place called Antioch, Antioch of Syria, and that's about 300 miles north of Jerusalem. So if you would go on that map to where it's cut off, Jerusalem would be below that, and so that's where the church uh, was really headquartered before that, and then this church becomes the great sending out church that would forever impact Christianity. And so just to give you a little grid for that. So this was a spirit-led call to missions that happened from this church in Antioch. What do we see here? Three things I want to point out. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit says. Other translation says, while they were ministering to the Lord. This is the same word that we get the kind of not so often used Christian term liturgy. Liturgeo in, in Greek. And what is liturgy? It was what actually the priest did. This was an Old Testament term, the priests ministering unto the Lord, bringing their sacrifices to the Lord. And the writer of Hebrews calls it bringing a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. The motivation that fueled a missions effort was first founded in a diverse group of people, these five guys, ministering unto the Lord. Notice that they're not ministering for the Lord, first of all, or they're not minist being ministered by the Lord, first of all, but their first occupation, their first motivation is they're ministering to the Lord. Just as the Old Testament priests of old, these New Testament leaders are ministering to the Lord. And I believe that it's intentional even as our vision statement we talked about, the, the first one being intimacy unto God, right? In, ministering to the Lord, intimacy with Jesus, feasting on God. Because for a second commandment work, for invitation for others into ministry to work effectively, you have to be ministering unto God first, pleasing God first. You know, as, as those who minister, as someone who's preaching the Bible, of course I'm thinking about how to minister to you guys. But if that's my first thing, eventually we'll give in to fear of man. Eventually I'll just be going about the job and my heart won't be refreshed and in love with Jesus myself. And that's a great danger of professional ministers, a great danger of any of us who are serving, is that you're doing it solely to minister to God and then you forget that first thing, intimacy with the Lord, feasting upon God. They're not ministering for the Lord, they're ministering to the Lord. And there was another great church of mission known as the Church of Ephesus. And in the book of Revelation, they, they did similar things to Antioch. They released incredible missions team, great mobilization, amazing fruit. But Jesus says, to th says this about them, I see the awesome things that you've done, but you forgot your first love to me. You're professionally ministering for the Lord, and you're not ministering to me anymore. When we're leading worship, when we're preaching, when we're doing any of these things, our first calling is that the Lord will be pleased by the offering that we bring him. And I want to just say this about y'all. Like, I, I love when y'all leads, leads worship because it's so intimacy-focused. 
And I really believe that when he's leading, and of course all of us, you know, in our in different times of flesh and whatever, like it's a wrestle for anyone, so I don't want to over-glorify him. But I really believe when he leads worship, it's unto the Lord. He's doing it with a lot of people here, but he's doing it unto the audience of one is an expression that I've, ter- that, I've, that I've heard. When he's singing about, you know, the confidence of the Lord, you are good, you are good, you are good, I really believe that he was ministering unto God in his heart. He wants to bring us along with him, and that's what a worship leader should do. That's what a preacher should do. I hope we can go together in this journey. But at the end of the day, if we're doing it only for you guys, we're nothing more than glorified customer service workers. If my only thing is making sure that you guys get what you want, you get served, you get, you get blessed, if that's my only preoccupation or, or as anyone who serves, we're not we're just doing customer service. We're not ministering unto God. And you can start in ministry to God like the church of Ephesus did, but eventually, little by little, it can be something else. And so we do want to be ministering for the Lord as a secondary goal. We do want to be ministered by the Lord, right? Isn't it awesome when you feel his pleasure, when you feel his touch, when I come to service and I feel like I got something out of it, and sometimes we'll talk like that after service. What did you feel like you got out of service, or I was ministered to or not, but that can't be our first thing. I do want you guys to be ministered to, and I hope you feel his presence, but you'll find the greatest blessing personally when it doesn't start about you. When you don't come to service thinking, what am I going to get out of this? But what is God going to get out of this? Is God pleased by my offering of worship to him? And I believe that if we're ever going to have a hope of, using, of doing missions in the right way, in the right vehicle that God will bless, it has to be a people that are ministering unto the Lord first, that are not just excited about going out on missions and all these kind of things, though you yourself will be blessed, though they'll get blessed, but it's because I want to be doing ministry unto the Lord first and foremost. And I find it really important that this church of Antioch that released this missions movement that changed the whole world started as a movement of very different people, but they all gathered together and said, we're going to minister unto the Lord together. There's a second piece that I think is easy and tempting to skip over as a minister, and that is this. They were also fasting. Fasting is a word that I jokingly say is like the F word in church. I don't believe that as Christians we should say the F word. I'll just make that clear. But I believe that also fasting sometimes can be a word that we're a little embarrassed to talk about. Or we try to lessen it right away. And I think that there's something powerful in media fasting and all sorts of different things. But I want to I say this, that I believe that fasting, fasting food especially, there's a variety of different types of fasting. And there's Daniel fasting, for example, of vegetables. And there's no food at all and different types of fasting. But I believe that fasting is a, is a key to the church that God never intended to go away that a, a t- leadership team together who's diverse, who has different personalities, who, you know, wrestles and sees things differently, they're to come together and minister unto the Lord, and I notice that they also fast. And I believe that that's important, that I see in the life of Jesus, him, his life was about fasting. The disciples, or I mean, the Pharisees come to Jesus and basically attack him, and they're like, why aren't the disciples fasting right now? The disciples of John were all about fasting. What, what happened to, to this fasting with your team? And Jesus says, fasting is not for every season necessarily. Right now, I'm in a season where I'm with the disciples. We're celebrating, right? Don't go to your best friend's wedding and fast. I think you should enjoy the food. Barring the Lord speaking, then, then do it. But there are times in which we're, we're supposed to feast, we're supposed to celebrate, that God actually gives food. And I heard about this amazing group last night that met for the, uh, the uh, what was it, the worship team, met over at Yoon's house, and he provided this amazing spread of seafood that my wife was, was raving about. She wasn't even on the worship team, but somehow she, <laughs> she got to go while I was preparing for this message. And you know, there's seasons in which we enjoy each other's fellowship around the d- dinner table. We saw that in the life of Jesus. But he said that there's a season in which my disciples will fast, and it's when I'm taken away, when they're mourning because I'm not with them. When the longing is so great because Jesus is not with us, they're going to fast. And I believe that the closer we get to God's return, 
the hunger that the Holy Spirit's going to release upon the church is going to be so overwhelming that the church is not going to be able to help but enter into a time of fasting as well. And so it's not all the time, but I believe that there is a place for fasting in the church that will release the Spirit of God that, that is important that, that we pursue. And so I notice that these leaders are praying and they're also fasting. And some things will not be unlocked without the power of fasting. Remember, there was, there was someone that uh, the son couldn't have the demon cast out of him. And it was, why can't they cast it out? And Jesus said, there's some that will not come out except for prayer and fasting. There's some revelation in the Lord that you cannot receive, I believe, without the joy of prayer and fasting together. Unto him, you're not doing fasting for yourself to show off. You're not doing fasting because you want to diet, right? That's not... There, we use that term fasting sometimes, but fasting in the Bible is about encountering the Lord and ministering to Him. And I believe that there is something here about release of missions connected to not only prayer, but also fasting as well. I was thinking this, this week about John chapter 15. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. He who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. That's ultimately the goal of ministering unto the Lord is we want to abide in him. Whether it's in our prayer closet by ourselves or before a whole company of people, it's possible to be ministering unto the Lord as my primary goal, even if it's in front of 10,000 or a million people. It's not about people. It's about disposition of the heart. And sometimes fasting helps to release that sense of abiding in the Lord. Even as I've been thinking about church history, there's many examples like this in which the power of God is released through fasting. In the first great awakening in America, there is this sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Some consider it the the one that launched this movement across all of America in the 1700s of leading hundreds of thousands to Christ. And, it's, and, he, and Jonathan Edwards, the man who was used as, as the preacher of this message, fasted and prayed for three days prior to preaching his famous sermon. And the, the stories of the conviction of heart, repenting before the Lord, were tremendous. People crying out, save me from hell. Power of fasting. Charles Finney in the second grade of awakening in the 1800s, he wrote that when the power of his preaching seemed to diminish. He would spend several days in prayer and fasting until the spirit of prayer returned and his preaching was again anointed with power. He acknowledged that the power on his preaching was connected to regular times of prayer with fasting. Over and over and over again, people that pray and fast often associated with revival. I rarely, I don't, I don't think you can even find stories of revival that has lasted throughout history without people that are gathering together in both prayer and fasting. The Welsh revival, the last one I'll share with you, Evan Roberts and his group of young saints fasted and prayed for five years, and then God moved his hand over Wales, and the great Welsh revival took place. There's something about fasting that I also feel that the Lord wants me to share with you today to consider as part of your walk with the Lord, as part of abiding in the Lord. Ministry unto the Lord, but fasting also can be very much part of that. And so that's the the first point for this morning, is ministering unto the Lord in prayer and fasting. Number two is in a culture of ministering to the Lord, we expect that God would speak eventually. Number two is hear from God. The Holy Spirit said in this context of prayer and fasting, here's what I want you to do. I want you to mobilize for this missions effort. Set apart for me these two men, Barnabas and Saul, for the mission activity that I have prepared for you guys. I believe that as we come together as a diverse people of God, not just by ourselves seeking the Lord, though we do need to have private prayer time with the Lord, but as we, as a team, here is the leadership team that's gathering together and regularly fasting and praying. In this context, we expect that God will speak. The hard part 
is if you've been seeking the Lord and you set apart a time, God doesn't speak on your agenda according to your timing. Wouldn't it be nice if I knew that, all right, it's 1226. For the next hour to 126, I'm going to have a time of prayer and fasting. And you are going to speak to me, God. Here I am. And after 126, I'm going to go, you know, do something else. I'm going to go to lunch. But even better yet, can you answer these questions? One, two, three for me. It doesn't work like that. God doesn't necessarily speak every single time we, we have this kind of prayer and fasting. I believe that the key to this is that the, the leadership team were regularly engaging in this. What we learned from church history is that it, among the Jews, they fasted on Monday and Thursday. They, they fasted two times a week. Early Christians fasted from on t- Wednesday and Friday. Basically, they were two times a week regularly fasting for years. So I don't know. I'm guessing this was not their first prayer meeting. Wouldn't it be nice if, like, now we got the leadership team together? All right, you guys now set, up, set apart some time for prayer and fasting, and the Lord's going to speak. It may not work like that. But eventually, in irregular communities of seeking the Lord in prayer, eventually we do expect that he does speak. And I believe that there's something about doing it together as a team. It says that the Lord spoke and says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. My question is, how did God speak? It doesn't say that exactly. Was it an audible voice like it was at Mount Sinai? We see that there are prophets and teachers, so maybe there were some that, you know, more regularly spoke in terms of what God is saying. Maybe there were a few in the community that, uh, a couple of these five that stood up and said, this is what God is saying. I'm not sure exactly how they got the word of the Lord, but God did in fact speak. And I think that a key to this is when we seek the Lord together in a group, we offer space to be able to hear from each other. What did you feel like God is saying? In the Old Testament, the prophets had to get a writer; they would get stoned. In the New Testament, the good news is we don't have that kind of like expectation of, of perfection, of clarity. We discern and we wrestle with each other, but we believe that God does release the prophetic in the New Testament church. And so basically, you know, if, if, if I get a word, then, then you guys will wrestle with the word yourself, and God will release confirmation if it was indeed him. And I believe an important principle is that we pray, seek the Lord together, maybe including fasting, but that we also create space within our teams, our spiritual family, to say, what do you think that God is saying? We share it with each other, because ultimately, God did desire to speak. And a people that set apart themselves to be able to hear God will, in fact, eventually hear God. I promise you that. Jesus said that my sheep will hear my voice, and they will obey me. Now, there are prophets and teachers. So there's also the Word of God. We're trained through the Word of God. We're discipled through the Word of God. We come here on Sundays to hear what the Word of God says because we want to be discipled by the Word of God. So God's Word is also, of course, through the teaching of Scripture. But there's also now words in which he'll highlight Bible verses, he'll speak things to us, and he'll say, now is the time I want you to pursue this. And so we should expect that when we gather together in prayer that God will speak, and we want to create the context in which we share what we feel like God is speaking. And I love that often at K1, the experience uh, that Pastor Susie develops is that after this hour and a half of worship and prayer, she'll often give an opportunity. Does anyone want to share what they feel like God, what, what they feel like God is speaking to the community? And hearing what someone else says encourages me in my own journey, encourages me in my faith. And maybe I share something, maybe I didn't really feel like I got it something, but God, through the company of people, desires to speak. And as we gather around his word, as we gather around prayer, we add in some fasting, I believe that we're going to speak and get revelation about future steps to take, even as it would be related to missions that God wants to release in our community. It's always been in context to prayer that God releases these things. Matthew 9, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers into his harvest field. Our ministry to God fuels the voice of God to be released amongst his people. And number three is there's an expectation of response to God's voice. If hearing God is just an interesting kind of exciting thing, but we're not following through on what the word of God says, that's a dangerous place to be. I'd rather not get the word of God than 
then not have the grace to be able to follow through and do what God is, is speaking and, and bringing us into a, as a people. And so number three, we are called to respond to God's voice, both through, again, scriptural teaching but also through Holy Spirit experience that we weigh under the Word of God, that we wrestle with. But when we believe that it is the Lord, I, I think that it's important that we consider how do we follow through on this Word? How can we obey the Lord? Not as an individual, but as a team. This is a team of, of leaders that were gathering together to hear God's voice. And after God said, I, wa- I want you to set apart these two, they confirmed it was in fact the Lord. After fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So this begins with fasting and prayer, and then it ends with fasting and prayer when they're determining that this is, in fact, the Lord, and this requires a response from our part. You know, this word actually, this word from Acts chapter 13 touched my heart again at the end of this year when I was considering what is it that I want New Philly to look like? Beyond, before I was thinking about missions, what is it that I would want our church family to look like? And the word that kept coming to my heart that I believe God gave me was this very passage, these four verses. The idea that our leadership team, basically I want our entire church family, but starting with our leadership team would regularly fast and pray together and that the Lord would speak to us. And so we got together, Gina, Pastor Susie, and I, and I just kind of blurted it out. I was like, this is what I hope to see, (laughs) not knowing if they would want to do it or not. Sometimes when you bring up fasting particularly, it can kind of rub rub people the wrong way. I shared about even the challenge of, of, of sharing that with you. But my dream to pray together, to be honest, is also associated with fasting together, that there is a place of fasting and praying as an individual, But what I see here is it's a team that's agreeing to fast and pray together. And I said, you know what I want to see, I hope to see, I dream to see is is us fasting and praying together. And they're like, okay, like, you know, maybe we'll do it. And and then I uh, followed up with Pastor Susie, and and she determined that we would set this space apart. And uh, Gina was on board as well. We actually invited Pastor Caleb in to, to join us at last minute as well. And Pastor Susie began to, to lead worship and had extended time of worship. And then we took like an hour and a half to just spend time in, our, uh, in different areas in the room, just spend time with the Lord, try to hear his voice, open up scripture, whatever it was. Just have a, a quiet time before for the Lord, similar to a K-1 type setting, ministering unto him. And then after our time together, we shared. And I felt like, like what God spoke to me is, what if I don't give you the marching orders? Meaning, I was looking for, like, we're going to take this time apart, and then God is going to give one of these, like, set apart Barnabas and Saul, like, immediate, here's the agenda, here's the strategy, here's making it seem like our time was worthwhile. Do you ever feel like that? Even as a minister, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I want to tell you that I'm spending my time in a worthwhile way. Like, you know, you guys give me some money to be able to do this job and stuff. And I, I, don't, I would sometimes feel like I've got to make a reason for why I need to have time of prayer and fasting. That the reason is that God said in that time that we're going to do this in the month of July and this in September. And it was like, even though it seemed like it could have been a waste of time, God spoke. And I felt like God rebuked my heart in a very gentle way. He said, what if I didn't give you the marching orders? Would that have been a good use of your time? Would it have been a good use of the staff time to just minister unto me, to just spend time in my presence? Would that, would that be enough? And the answer, of course, is yes. That would be enough, Lord. <laughs> this was the most worthwhile thing we could have done today to be able to s- take this time apart and be with you. And the cool thing is that as we did share after that and and getting to hear different people share is there were things that God was speaking. You know, pictures that people had and uh, being able to hear from Pastor Caleb and what he's going through and just wrestling together and, and feeling a sense of what God is highlighting. And it was that I want you as a people to be praying and seeking the Lord together. And I believe that eventually if we have a culture like that, eventually there will be a moment like this. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Here's the clear plans of how I want to launch you into missions. Maybe here's like the country you're going to go to. I don't know how it works exactly, 
But I am convinced that this blueprint in Scripture in Antioch is where it has to begin for the fruit ultimately to remain. That if God did indeed speak the second pillar as well, that missions would happen, it's on the back end of a people who are regularly praying and seeking the Lord together, even fasting I'm believing for. And so I was so encouraged, you know, after this, this meeting, Gina was like, I hope we can do this regularly, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to do it and what's, what it's going to look like. I'm not sure. But I'm convinced that the leaders in the body of Christ need to have corporate prayer meetings ministering unto the Lord, not about preparing for my ministry on Sunday only, right? We, on Friday, we have a time of reading through the Scripture. And if, it was, if we were only reading Scripture for that, so that we can minister for the Lord and share everything, I believe we're missing it. That ultimately, it's ministry unto the Lord. This time of, of seeking the Lord together is what is the, the vehicle in which God is going to release a great missions effort. And so that's, that's my prayer, that's my belief, is that the Lord would, in fact, release us into mission in His timing, in His way. Maybe this is a year from now, maybe this is two years from now, I have no idea. But I do believe that if we want to see the second pillar released in our church, which we didn't even know what that was for most of us, God is saying, I want you to mobilize. I want you to pray. I want you to ask me about these things. I want to be able to share that intimacy, that joy that I've experienced with others. And I believe that as we gather together in prayer meetings, starting with the leadership team, it has to begin with the leadership team, that we're going to see God bringing this vision to our church as well. And so I want to invite the, the leadership team up. I mean, sorry, the... <laughs> Amen. That was... That's right. <laughs> The worship team is our leadership team. That, that wasn't a Freudian slip. It was a Jesus slip, maybe. All right. Jesus, I thank you that you brought a very unique group to this church all the different members, all the different unique stories, all the different backgrounds. In a way, we resemble this five-person team here. Different economic backgrounds, different ethnicities, religious upbringing. Some are brought up in the faith from childhood. Others have had a really rough start even like the friend of the family friend of Herod but you called Menin to be a leader of this church and I thank you for the unique stories that are here I thank you that no background disqualifies in fact the journey is richer doing it alongside these different brothers and sisters. And Lord, I ask that you would show us the space that you want us to make for this. Maybe it's make time to be able to, to join into K1. Maybe it's another prayer meeting outside. I'm really not interested in having New Philly be the only thing that we're promoting here. I've heard about Dwell and this awesome worship night that many people have been attending. There was a prayer meeting that we were invited to as a church and with Korean churches all gathered together and they invited us to join in. In whatever way, I'm asking that you would make places for us to pray together. Whether it's joining in someone else's prayer meeting, whether it's here, I ask that you would give wisdom and revelation to every individual here. How can I join in a regular time of prayer before the Lord? How can I do it together as a team? Maybe I've done this by myself, but I don't want to just do it by myself, Lord. You haven't called me to do it just by myself. We see, the, we see Daniel and his friends. There was a team doing it together. Even Jesus himself had a team. If anyone didn't need a team, you know, it's Jesus. But he delighted to have a team to be able to pray. And he longed in his heart. Peter, James, and John, can you not bear with me even for an hour? Pray with me in this moment. 
The heart of Jesus is pray with me. It's not just spending time together, being, having meals together, though we need that. At the end of the day, if we only do that, we're a social club. But I want to pray with my brothers and sisters, God. I want to pray with these who you've sent to this church. I pray that you would even give hunger for fasting. This cannot come from man. If it's pushed by man, it doesn't produce the fruit of God. But if it's hunger for Jesus, I can't possibly wait anymore because I'm so desperate for Christ to fill me. Even more than my physical needs of food, Jesus, I want you. I ask that you would release grace and fasting to this community, Lord. Show us how, show us the way. But even may our times of prayer be filled with hunger for fasting. And I believe that this blueprint is true. That in this context of a people praying and fasting together, that you desire to speak, that you will speak. It may not be in the way, it may not be in the timing, but there is a season that you've ordained to set apart Barnabas and Saul. I ask that you would increase the prophetic ministry in our church, that we could hear your voice, increase the teaching ministry in the church. We need each other to hear God. God will speak to you individually, and we don't just rely on other people to hear God for me, but actually the voice of God is meant to be released through the church to others. And I ask that you would increase that in this church community, God. I believe in your word that in this context of prayer that you desire to speak. And give us the grace to respond. If you're only speaking because that would be fun or interesting, but we're not doing it, what a loss we would have. We want to be the sheep who hear your voice and obey what you're saying. And so I'm asking God for missions. So we began talking about these pillars of the church. I thank you for this vision of the church. Feasting. Calling all to the feast. And I pray that feasting on the Lord, ministering unto you, would be our first preoccupation. It would be that which fuel us all the days of our lives. And from that preoccupation that we would desire to go out and share. Give us strategies from heaven of what that looks like, both domestically, internationally. There always may be spontaneous ministries. I don't believe that we have to wait for that. I pray that you would have opportunities to be able to share your faith even today. But I'm also asking for that formal mission planning of the Lord to come to our hearts as we seek him and ask him for that. Show us what that looks like. Allow us per to participate in the great Antioch hour in the church that you're going to release all across the body of Christ. COVID stopped missions in a lot of ways all throughout the body of Christ. And I believe that one of the reasons is that God is saying, I want to get people praying for the next season. Not just to expect it would be business as usual, but to be praying as a people for what, is, what are your divine plans and strategies. Would you release missions, Lord? And that when the time comes for you to speak, I pray that we would obey as a people. It would not just be Pastor Susie that's getting the word. It would be we as a family of God, we as those who are part of New Philadelphia Church, or if you're part of another church, I pray that you would have the same revelation in your church and that we would be able to obey that which he has for us. May you equip us for missions. May we be gifted with the blessing of inviting others to the feast. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's end with a song together as we worship the Lord.